for all our applications uh, and for the lab uh, sessions. Uh, um, I guess I keep using Albert Einstein. This is the 100th anniversary of this uh, the famous year 1905. So just a little celebration. Um, one slide uh, of a reminder of what we have seen uh, in the previous, uh, previous lecture. Um, we had really developed the formalism uh, leading to the Hartree-Fock equations. Uh, and the Hartree-Fock equation follow from a sort of you know, very simple and very beautiful path. Uh, we have the Schrodinger equation, and we have reformulated the Schrodinger equation in terms of the variational principle. So we have a functional, and we know that we can throw into that functional any arbitrary wave function, and they'll give us an expectation value of the energy. And sort of the closer we get uh, to the true ground state wave function, the lower that energy is going to be. We are, not, we are never going to go below the ground state energy. And so it's sort of a va very powerful approach uh, to try out a sort of possibilities and solution. Um, and in particular, sort of Hartree and Fokker uh, took this approach. Uh, they wrote uh, uh, sort of the most general many body wave function uh, that can be written as a product uh, of single particle orbitals. Uh, that was actually the original Hartree solution. Uh, wave functions written as that uh, do not satisfy a fundamental symmetry of interacting fermions. That is, they are not anti-symmetric. And so what you do, you take uh, this product of single particle orbitals uh, and you sum it uh, with all the possible permutation, with all the possible signs in front uh, so that the overall wave function is anti-symmetric. Uh, and that can be sort of written compactly as what is called a Slater determinant here. And basically now our unknowns are the n orbitals uh, phi, and so we need to determine the shape of this n single particle orbitals. Uh, and we want to determine them such that uh, they minimize the expectation value of the variational principle. Uh, and so the, that leads basically to a set of differential equation is just functional analysis. Uh, and when you ask yourself uh, what are the conditions that those single particle orbitals need to satisfy in order to minimize the variational principle, well, this is it, uh, the Hartree-Fock uh, equation. So each uh, single particle orbital, phi of lambda, need to satisfy basically a Schrodinger-like equation. Again, as always, there is a kinetic energy term here. There is the interaction uh, with the external potential, that is just the potential of the nuclei. And then come the so-called mean field terms. Uh, so the electron lambda here will interact uh, with each and every other electron mu via an electrostatic interaction. You see phi star times phi is the charge density coming from the orbital mu. And the field uh, that the, the electron lambda fills uh, is the electrostatic average density. And in this, uh, we sum over all the electrons, uh, including the electron lambda. So up to now, we have a system that is self-interacting. Uh, an electron lambda fills the electrostatic interaction with itself. Uh, that, in principle, is not correct. Uh, but luckily, this next term that is called the exchange term uh, cancels that exactly. And the exchange term uh, is the direct consequence uh, of having written the trial wave function not just as a product of single particle orbital, because up to now we would have sort of something closer to the Hartz equation, but written as a proper anti-symmetric wave function, summing on all the permutation with the appropriate signs. Uh, and so basically we have Schrodinger-like equation. A great advantage with respect to the Hartz equation is now the operator doesn't change uh, depending on the index lambda, because these sums, if you want, uh, go over the, all the electrons, including lambda. So our uh, only constraint here is that we need to find uh, the n lowest uh, eigenstate uh, of this single differential equation. So if we have n electrons, if you want, uh, uh, it's not that we have n different uh, differential equation, like it was the case of the Hartz equation, but we have a identical differential equation that is written here. And we need to find uh, the n lowest uh, energy states. Uh, and those will be our single particle orbitals. Uh, in all of this, uh, we have started from a variational principle. So it's very easy to go beyond uh, Hartree-Fock. Uh, we can say enlarge our variational class. Uh, we can add uh, 
more slated determinants uh, with sort of different coefficients, we can try to construct a more complex uh, wave function, and our solution will become better and better. Or we can sort of use a perturbation theory. And so quantum chemistry has developed uh, uh, a number of techniques uh, that are post Hartree Fock techniques uh, that become uh, systematically more and more accurate. Uh, they are also more and more expensive, uh, and that's, if you want, uh, the main limitation of that direction. Um, what we'll see today is something, uh, as they say in Monty Python, completely different. Uh, and that will be sort of density functional theory. That's, if you want, a theory that starts from um, a very different uh, set of hypotheses. Uh, um, the net result uh, will be, again, a set of single particle equations uh, that are sort of very similar, actually, formally to the Hartree Fock equation, uh, but they have been derived uh, in a completely different <laughs> spirit. Uh, um, density functional theory tends to be less expensive than Hartree Fock, uh, and overall tends to be more accurate, uh, especially for solid. It's much more accurate. Uh, you'll see when we discuss case studies, uh, the Hartree Fock solution for the, say, interacting electron gas or in general for metals, uh, tends to make them uh, semiconducting or insulating like. Uh, so Hartree Fock tends to work very poorly for solids. And that's why if you want density functional theory, comes from the solid state community. While Hartree Fock that tends to work uh, very well for atoms comes from the quantum chemistry community. And um, all the theory uh, was developed uh, by Walter Cohn and co-workers. Uh, you'll see the Hoenberg and Cohn theorem, the Cohn and Sham mapping. Uh, during the 60s, uh, uh, but I would say uh, it's only during the 70s that people started to be able to actually solve interesting cases using density functional theory, and it's really the beginning of the 80s. You'll see some cases here today in which people started calculating something that had sort of a direct uh, um, application. So we'll see the phase diagram of silicon as a function of pressure or volume, and sort of the first, the first principle prediction of properties of solids. Uh, um, Walter Cohn, uh, for the development of density functional theory, got the Nobel Prize uh, for chemistry in 1998, uh, together with John Popol, that has been the person that has been sort of uh, <coughs> most, um, that's been fundamental in the development of Hartree Fock and post Hartree Fock approaches in quantum chemistry. Okay, so let's see sort of what is the, the general idea behind density functional theory. And uh, in many ways, uh, we'll uh, sort of start uh, from ideas that had been developed uh, at the end of the 20s or at the beginning of the 30s, uh, what is nowadays called the Thomas Fermi approach. Uh, and again, the basic idea here is that the wave function uh, of a many-body interacting problem is an object that is too complex to treat. Uh, and it would be very, very nice uh, if we could instead uh, try to deal uh, with a simple object. And sort of one of the choices could be the charge density. So if you want a Thomas and Fermi independently, we're asking themselves, uh, well, could we try to solve uh, not really a Schrodinger equation in the many body wave function, but solve something else uh, in which our only unknown uh, is the charge density. If you think for a moment, the charge density is one of the sort of fundamental variables in the description of an uh, interacting electron problem. And so this, is, this was the question, can we do something just with the charge density. And so what they did uh, is writing out uh, what we would call a heuristic function, uh, that is trying to devise uh, uh, a set of terms uh, that would give us uh, the energy of a set of electrons in a potential just as a functional of their charge density. And so, you know, sort of by now, you could sort of think that some of, you know, the relevant terms uh, will be electron-electron interactions, electron interact, and uh, we could write a sort of electrostatic term, like the Hartree term in the Hartree or the Hartree Fock equation, that is just a functional of the charge density. So this is sort of fairly easy. Um, it's also very easy to sort of, you know, imagine what could be the interaction of the electrons with an external potential through the charge density. It will be just the integral of that external potential times the charge density. What becomes really critical is you know, finding uh, a functional that will give us uh, the quantum kinetic energy. If you think in the Schrodinger equation, the quantum kinetic energy is really the second derivative of the wave function. And 
obtaining from a charge density only some insight into what could be the second derivative of the wave function is very complex. Uh, um, if you think for a moment at the extreme case of a plane wave, okay, so a sine and cosine um, sort of in space, uh, if you remember the charge density given by a plane wave uh, is a constant. Uh, we just multiply the exponential times the, com the imaginary exponential times its complex conjugate uh, that gives us a constant. Uh, so all plane waves uh, lead to a constant, but obviously the quantum kinetic energy of a plane wave uh, depends uh, on the wavelength uh, of that plane wave, because the second derivative is what counts. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is that when we look uh, at sort of this as a possible wave function, uh, a function, say, of r, and the charge density that comes from this uh, is going to be a constant. Uh, this wave function times this complex conjugate, uh, but the kinetic energy of this object uh, is going to be minus one half k square. Sorry, plus one half k square. And so there is really not a good way for this extreme case uh, to correlate uh, its charge density to its kinetic energy. It's an ill-defined problem. And this is really the difficulty, okay? So there isn't really a good way, if you want, uh, to extract information on the second derivative from just a charge density. Uh, no matter sort of this objection, they tried uh, sort of to find uh, a reasonable functional, so without sort of trying to get the exact solution, but try to find uh, a reasonable functional that would give us uh, a good estimate to the kinetic, to the quantum kinetic energy starting from the charge density. And the solution to this problem that is something very important uh, uh, is what we could call a local density approximation. So the problem here is that uh, we have a non-homogeneous charge density everywhere in space, uh, and we try to figure out uh, what could be the quantum kinetic energy of this uh, non-homogeneous problem. And uh, sort of the approximation that Thomas and Fermi did uh, was sort of, well, dividing uh, this non-homogeneous problem uh, in a set of sort of infinitesimal volume in space. Uh, so it's a bit difficult to draw, but suppose you have the density, charge density coming from some atom or some molecule. This is a non-homogeneous charge density distribution. Now what you do is you divide this uh, in space uh, in sort of very small infinitesimal, if you want, volume. And uh, inside uh, each volume, uh, the charge density can be approximated as a constant. Uh, and what Thomas and Fermi said is, well, the contribution coming uh, from this infinitesimal volume, say the first one, to the overall quantum kinetic energy will be given by that volume times uh, the kinetic energy density of the homogeneous electron gas at that density. So if, again, we partition all space, uh, we could have that, you know, the density in this little cube is 0.5, here is 0.6, here is 0.7, outside uh, it goes to zero. But we can actually calculate uh, in some other way what would be the quantum kinetic energy of a homogeneous electron gas. That's a problem that we can solve if the homogeneous electron gas is non-interacting, and we can solve it numerically even if it is interacting. So we can know what is the quantum kinetic energy of a homogeneous gas with density 0.5, density 0.6, density 0.7. And so we can also know what would be the quantum kinetic energy per unit of volume of that. And so we'll say that this non-homogeneous system in blue will have an overall quantum kinetic energy that is given really by the integral across space and it's written here, of the quantum kinetic energy of the homogeneous electron gas integrated over space. And say for the non-interacting electron gas, it's actually very easy to do. So if you have a non-interacting electron gas at a density rho, its quantum kinetic energy is just rho to the 2 thirds that then integrated time the unit volume gives us a rho to the 5 thirds. So by integrating uh, this quantity, 
we would get an approximation. This approximation is basically exact uh, in the limit uh, of a homogeneous system, obviously, and it will be sort of quite good uh, in the limit uh, of a non-homogeneous system that has a very slowly changing uh, charge density. The more, if you want, uh, inhomogeneous uh, your system becomes, uh, the less accurate uh, this approximation is. Uh. And of course, something like an atom or a molecule uh, is a very inhomogeneous system. You go with a charge density that goes from zero to very high volumes uh, close to the core of the nuclei. So this is basically the overall answer, so the overall expression uh, that Thomas and Fermi postulated uh, for the energy of an inhomogeneous system. They were saying, uh, well, suppose that we have a system that has a certain distribution of charge uh, rho without trying to solve uh, the Schrodinger equation, finding out the wave function, and sort of go through that sort of very complex many body route, uh, we can actually sort of postulate uh, that the energy could be written again as an electrostatic energy. You see sort of each infinitesimal volume interacting with each other infinitesimal volume times uh, via one over r electrostatic interaction. Then we have got an external potential. Again, it's usually the Coulombic field of the nuclei. And so the interaction between the electron and that external potential is just trivially given by rho times v. And the difficult term, uh, the quantum kinetic energy, has been calculated uh, with a local density approximation. And this is the term that's not going to be very good, uh, again, because it's very difficult uh, to figure out uh, what could be the curvature of a wave function just from the density that that wave function produces. But anyhow, this is a very simple expression to deal with. Uh, so for any external potential v, we can try to find out uh, the rho that minimizes this expression, uh, and this will be our Thomas Fermi solution. Uh, there are obviously a number of problems. I'll show you in a moment an example of what the Thomas Fermi solution would give to an atom. Um, first of all, uh, I mean, there is really no theoretical basis to this. Uh, it's what we call a heuristic derivation. Thomas and Fermi just wrote out uh, what could be a reasonable energy functional and then try to sort of see what results it would give. Uh, but there hasn't been any kind of you know, formal derivation of that function. Uh, it's not like the Hartree-Fock equation that sort of derive just with some analysis from the variational principle. Um, another problem is that, again, it doesn't really sort of introduce the concept uh, of anti-symmetry that fermions need to have. The fact that the many body wave function needs to be anti-symmetric uh, upon exchange. Uh, but you know, there is no conceptual problem in adding uh, an exchange energy to the previous functional uh, using the same concept, uh, the same idea of local density approximation. Suppose that we want to add uh, an exchange term. Uh, well, we could look uh, at what is the exchange energy coming from the Hartree-Fock equation, say, for a homogeneous electron gas. Uh, and that gives us a rho to the one-third term. Uh, and that's basically the exchange energy density. And so for an inhomogeneous system, uh, we are going to sort of approximate uh, its overall exchange energy just by taking the integral of that uh, energy density that is one-third uh, times uh, the sort of local value of the charge density, and so we have a rho to the fourth third. And so again, it's a local density approximation. Uh, the sort of great consequence of having this uh, um, energy functional that depends only on R is that it is absolutely inexpensive from the computational point of view. The only variable that we need to be concerned with uh, is just uh, a scalar as a function of three coordinates, that is the density as a function of rho. And it's what we call a linear scaling system. If you double the size uh, of your system, uh, the computational complexity uh, just becomes double. So it has a lot of very good things, uh, but it's got 
a fundamental defect. Because of that approximation in the kinetic energy, it actually does uh, a very poor job uh, in uh, describing a non-homogeneous system. So it would work uh, reasonably well uh, uh, for something like a metal. Suppose that you want to describe uh, sodium, or suppose you want to describe uh, aluminum. Uh, those are systems in which the valence electron uh, produce a charge density that is very homogeneous. So a Thomas Fermi approach uh, could actually work well. And it's actually been used, uh, even very recently, sort of quite successfully, to describe uh, problems like uh, the surfaces of lithium, the surfaces of aluminum, what happens say, what, when these simple metals uh, melt, uh, what happens to the sort of formation of defects uh, in aluminum. So there, there are a number of successes. But sort of, you know, clear example of what goes wrong uh, is, say, if we study an inhomogeneous system uh, like the argon atom. And again, if we think at the charge density of the argon atom as a function, say, of the radial distance uh, from the center from the nucleus, uh, well, it will look something like this. We have first the 1s, and then we have the 2s and the 2p shells. Uh, OK, this is somewhat a poor uh, depiction of that charge density. If we try to solve uh, the argon atom uh, with a Thomas Fermi approach, uh, all this sort of you know, fine structure of the core shells uh, in the um, atoms uh, is completely washed out. Uh, okay. So it gives you a reasonable approximation and uh, sort of an appropriate decay of the charge density as we move far away. But a lot of those details uh, have completely disappeared. And for this reason, uh, really, the Thomas Fermi approach uh, uh, wasn't developed uh, beyond the 30s, apart from sort of, you know, some of these recent applications for the very specific case of solids that have a very homogeneous charge density. Uh, the reason why we describe it here is that because, in many ways, uh, it's the grandfather uh, of the ideas uh, that were developed in the 60s in density functional theory. And in particular, the idea that for a moment uh, we should focus uh, not on the wave function, but on the charge density of the system as uh, the key ingredient. Um, the great difference between the Thomas Fermi approach uh, and density functional theory is that density functional theory actually is a theory. It starts with some theorems that are proven, and then it shows uh, what are the form of the equations uh, that, say, a charge density needs to satisfy in order to solve exactly the problem. So in many ways, density functional theory is, an, in principle at least, uh, an exact theory. It sort of writes out uh, what are the equations that the charge density needs to satisfy. And those are absolutely equivalent uh, to a Schrodinger equation for the wave function. Uh, there are some difficulties, and this is what we are going to sort of go into right now. But sort of let me first give you the conceptual framework uh, of density functional theory and sort of how it was derived. And as usual, we start uh, from the Schrodinger equation. Okay, So we start from the idea that in quantum mechanics, uh, for any given external potential, you have a well-defined differential equation. Okay, It's sort of very complex. Uh, it describes a many-body wave function. So in most practical cases, we might not be able to solve it, uh, but everything is well defined. You have an external potential. You have the differential equation that the many-body wave function needs to satisfy. And so in principle, you have the solution. And so in that sense, uh, sort of, you know, the first statement here is summarized. Uh, for a given external potential, and knowing uh, how many electrons uh, are going to fill this potential, uh, our quantum problem is formally completely defined. In principle, the solution exists unique. We might not be able to calculate it, but it exists. Uh, and uh, once we know the many body wave function, that solution, we know everything uh, about uh, our quantum system. OK. So this is, if you want, uh, the trivial part uh, of the conclusion. That is, given an external potential, we find, uh, by the Schrodinger equation, the wave function. Uh, the wave function determine all the properties of our system, and in particular, determine the ground state charge density. So there is a unique pathway that starts uh, from the external potential uh, 
and leads us to the charge density, the ground state charge density. Once you have defined the potential, you, in principle, have uniquely defined what is the ground state charge density of your system. And so in that sense, uh, we say that the ground state charge density, the ground state energy, and all the properties of our system are, uh, in some complex way, a functional of our uh, external potential and the number of electrons. Functional, again, you know, can be anything. Uh, and in this case, uh, it goes through the Schrodinger equation. Nothing sort of complex uh, at, this, uh, at this point. Uh, the sort of remarkable result uh, that no one had sort of, you know, figured out uh, between uh, 1964 and 1965 uh, is that the opposite uh, is also true. And it's not trivial at all. So what uh, Hoenberg and Kohn stated, uh, first actually in 1964, was this, that the ground state charge density is a fundamental quantity as fundamental as the external potential. And in particular, not only the external potential, the terms uh, uniquely the ch ground state charge density of your system, but also the vice versa is true. That is, given a ground state charge density, in principle, one can prove uh, that there is a unique uh, external potential for which that ground state charge density is the ground state solution for that external potential. So if you have the external potential, conceptually, it's trivial to go through the Schrodinger equation and its solution to the charge density. What Hoenberg and Kohn are telling us, and I'll just show you a sketch of the proof in a moment, uh, is that in principle, if someone is giving you a charge density and is telling you this charge density is the ground state charge density of a number of electrons and electrons in an external potential, in principle, what is that external potential is an information that is completely contained into the charge density. Okay. And it's not contained in a trivial way. It's not that you can look at a ground state charge density and guess uh, what the external potential is. And that's where all the complexity of practical density functional theory comes. But from the conceptual and mathematical point of view, these two quantities are absolutely equivalent. From one, you get the other, and vice versa. And the sort of uh, uh, vice versa was not trivial. And that is sort of you know, what is contained uh, in the so-called uh, first uh, Hohenberg and Kohn problem. I, I, I won't go through the derivation. It's actually very simple. I've printed it here in case you sort of want to read it. But it's basically is a derivation ad absurdum. What they are saying uh, is that if uh, that external potential were not unique, uh, if there were two external potential that were different and would give the same ground state energy, we would get to an absurdum. Okay. So typical mathematical de demonstration. We suppose that there are two different external potentials that give the same ground state charge density. And we show that we arrive to a conclusion that doesn't make sense. So there can be only a single external potential. And that's the proof. And again, it wasn't trivial. I mean, it's, if you want, it's a very basic statement. But it took 40 years to be formulated. And it's actually not true in other cases uh, that, you know, to first glance look very similar. Suppose that for a moment uh, we want to discuss excited states. Uh, you could say, well, if I have a charge density and I say this is an the charge density of an excited electronic state, uh, maybe I could also recover the potential that has generated that. And that's not true, actually. So there are sort of a number of cases in which this is not true. But for this fundamental sort of relation between the charge density of the ground state and the external potential, this is true. So we have sort of moved away now our attention. It's not anymore the many body wave function that we want to focus, uh, but is the charge density. The charge density is as much a fundamental variable of our problem. It's not a derived variable. It's not something that comes from the wave function, but it's something that we can actually focus uh, all our attention into. And now we need to find uh, 
the equivalent of the Schrodinger equation for the charge density. This is what Schrodinger had done in the 20s, in 1925. He said, this is the equation that quantum objects satisfy, and I'll call it the Schrodinger equation. Now, Hoenberg and Kohn have shown that we don't need to think in terms of the wave function. We can think in terms of the charge density as being the fundamental descriptor of our quantum system. What is left that they need to show me that there is an equivalent of the Schrodinger equation. That is, we can write uh, a density equation that is uh, sort of what will give me the ground state and sort of all the properties of the system. And that's really the second uh, Hohenberg and Kohn uh, theorem. That is really writing out uh, the equivalent uh, conceptual of the Schrodinger equation for the charge density. And now sort of it becomes fairly conceptual. OK, so this is uh, the procedure. And all of this, uh, in the next few slides, uh, is still a conceptual procedure. It will describe objects uh, that are well-defined in principle, uh, that are conceptually well-defined, but we still don't have a clue on you know, what they look like in practice. And all the sort of density functional application go through a procedure that we'll see later on that is the sort of connection mapping that gives a hint of what these objects look like. But up to now, we are going to introduce objects that are well-defined in principle, but we don't know how they look like. And so that's why somehow density functional theory is a much less intuitive theory than something like Hatchifock. OK, so this is going towards uh, the second Hohenberg and Kohn theorem defining uh, the fundamental equation for the charge density. And this is the step. For any charge density rho, so someone uh, gives you, someone draws you an arbitrary charge density, well, we know that there is uh, an external potential of which that charge density is the ground state. We don't know what it is, honestly, but we have proven that there is a unique uh, external potential. OK. So because there is a unique external potential, there is a, a many-body Schrodinger equation uh, with that potential in there. And there is a, a wave function uh, that is going to be the ground state wave function of that many-body Schrodinger equation. So given a certain rho, we know that an external potential exist and it's unique it determines uh, it determines a schrodinger equation and that schrodinger equation determines uh, a ground state wave function that we call psi so what we are saying uh, is that given a rho in principle the psi the ground state wave function of the Schrodinger equation in the external potential that is uniquely defined by the rho is also a well-defined object. Again, we don't know what it is, but it is well-defined. And because it's a well-defined object, uh, we can calculate uh, the expectation value of that well-defined object uh, of the quantum kinetic energy, you know, minus one half sum over all i of the second derivatives, uh, and uh, the electron-electron interaction, just uh, the 1 over Ri minus Rj term. So again, this term is, in principle, well-defined. And we call this term uh, the universal density functional. That is, for any given arbitrary rho, I, in principle, can define a number that is this number here. I have the rho. In principle, from the rho, I have the external potential. From the external potential, I have the Schrodinger equation. In principle, I'm able to solve that Schrodinger equation, found in principle the many body ground state wave function. That will be psi. And I can calculate uh, the expectation value of psi of the quantum kinetic energy and of the electron electron interaction term all well defined. We have really no clue on how to calculate because we can't really do in practice any of these steps. Uh, but this universal functional of the density 
is uh, well defined. So with this universal functional that is now well defined, uh, we can write out something. We can write uh, an energy for any given external potential uh, and for any given charge density. And we write it as this. So for any given charge density, there will be a well-defined number that is this universal density functional of that uh, rho prime. And then we add uh, another term uh, that is just trivially the integral of this uh, V, this external potential, times uh, the charge density rho prime. So again, this new expression that we have written is uh, well defined for any rho prime and for any external potential, we can calculate trivially this term. And in principle, we know what this number is. And this is, if you want, 1964, 1965, the reformulation of quantum mechanics. Because now, Hoenberg and Kohn are able to prove that there is a variational principle. That is, for this expression written here, for this functional of rho prime, we can prove that for any rho prime that we can throw in, the overall numerical value of this expression is always going to be either greater or equal to the ground state charge, uh, to the ground state energy that we would obtain from the Schrodinger equation in the presence of this external potential. So now we have a well-defined density functional. So if you have an external potential, the z over r of your atom, you can try out now not wave functions that are very difficult, but you can try out charge density. And the charge density that gives you the lowest expectation value, the lowest value for this functional, will be the ground state of charge density. Small problem, eh? we have no clue what this looks like as a function of rho prime. But if we knew, we would have a wonderfully simple approach to quantum mechanics. Eh? Now we don't need to deal with the many body complexity. We just minimize uh, this expression as a function of rho prime. And again, it's sort of fairly easy to prove uh, this variational principle, uh, but one needs probably to sit. I've given you some reading, so you're welcome, if you're really interested in this, to go back and read the first Hoenberg and Kohn theorem and read the second Hoenberg and Kohn theorem. But in many ways, the, the proof uh, of this second Hoenberg and Cohen theorem uh, can be done again through the variational principle. That is, you know, if we have a certain rho prime, uh, well, that again uniquely determine the ground state wave function. Rho prime will determine an external potential that in principle is different from this, uh, but rho prime will determine an external potential and will determine a wave function that is the solution of the many body Schrodinger equation. And if we take the expectation value of uh, R Hamiltonian with this external potential in this, uh, but evaluated uh, on the wave function C prime uh, that comes from this charge density rho prime, uh, well, we can sh show that this expectation value here is just identical to this functional that I just written. And uh, for the variational principle, then it needs to be greater or equal than E0. Uh, I won't sort of dwell into that. And again, you can look at the sort of detailed description in sort of some of the many references that I've given or that I've also posted on the website. But what is conceptually important is that we have a new equation. OK, so 1964-65, quantum mechanics turned around. We don't have to think at many body wave functions we can think uh, just at charge density. And um, all would be well apart uh, from this detail uh, that we don't know what that functional f uh, 
of rho is. And so we have a conceptual approach, but we don't have a practical approach to solve the density functional reformulation of quantum mechanics. And this is, if you want, a true to this day. We don't know what is the exact form of f of rho. If we knew it, uh, sort of, you know, most of our uh, sort of quantum mechanical computational problems would be trivially solved because solving that variational principle in the charge density would be most likely a trivial thing to do. Uh, the issue is that uh, not only we don't know, but we have understood a lot uh, of what that exchange correlation, of what that um, universal density functional is, uh, and it's very complex. Okay, so uh, it's unlikely that there is a, a sort of simple analytical expression of it uh, as a function of the charge density only. But you know the other sort of great piece. Uh, of, if you want, quantum engineering by Walter Kohn, uh, was finding out uh, a very good approximation to that density functional. Okay. We don't know what the exact one is, uh, but now what they are doing uh, is, uh, well, finding out uh, one uh, that is going to be very, very closely similar to the exact one. Uh, and so they are going to throw in uh, some physical intuition to this problem that up to now, if you want, uh, has been a mathematical problem. It's another layer of complexity in this discussion, so I hope I'm not losing you. But sort of what uh, Walter Kohn did, I think he had a, a young postdoc arriving from Cambridge, Lou Sham had just done his uh, PhD in England, and came there and sort of, you know, he told him, I have this new variational principle, let's see what we can do to make it into a practical solution. Um, I think they were in Santa Barbara, or in, in San Diego probably at that time. OK, so this is what they are going to do. Remember sort of, you know, what is the problem? We need to figure out uh, what uh, is uh, a reasonable approximation to this uh, functional here. So what they say is, uh, well, suppose that someone has given us uh, this charge density. So we need, in principle, to find out uh, what would be the many body wave function that is solution of this external potential that corresponds to this charge density. This is going to be very complex. Uh, let's invent uh, a problem uh, in which electrons do not interact uh, between each other. Okay. So electrons, uh, that's, that's the sort of you know, uh, main problem in the Schrodinger equation, that electrons interacting with each other introduce that two-body electrostatic repulsion in the Schrodinger equation, and that's what makes it difficult. Well, what Kohn and Sham say is, uh, let's for a moment suppose uh, that there is a system of electrons that don't interact. Uh, the only thing that those uh, so-called Kohn and Sham electrons uh, feel uh, is uh, the external potential. Okay? So those Kohn and Sham electrons uh, will solve, will satisfy a Schrodinger equation uh, that is much simpler because there is no electron-electron interaction. Those uh, Konechham electrons, the only thing that they feel is a new potential uh, and they will have their own uh, quantum kinetic energy. So what they are saying is uh, for any given charge density rho, okay, there is going to be a non-interacting uh, set of electrons uh, whose uh, ground state uh, charge density is identical to rho. Okay. So we have said, you know, if we have a charge density rho, you can all go through, you know, find out uh, the external potential that comes from the rho, the Schrodinger equation, the many body interacting uh, electrons solution. But now what we are going to say is uh, we can also think at a system of non-interacting electrons, uh, and uh, we want uh, those non-interacting electrons to feel a potential that is such that uh, their ground state uh, is going to give us a charge density that is identical to the charge density I'm dealing with. Okay. And we call that external potential the Kohn-Sham potential. Okay. So now, 
for a charge density, you don't only have to think at all the complexity that I've discussed up to now, but you have also to think that for a charge density, there is going to be this set of Kone Sham non interacting electrons, and there is going to be a potential that is called the Kone Sham potential that is such that uh, the ground state uh, of the Schrodinger equation for non interacting electron, that is without the electron electron interaction, in that Kone Sham potential will give us a wave function and a ground state uh, that is that leads to a charge density identical to the charge density I'm sort of dealing with. Okay, what do we do with this? Um, well, at this stage, uh, there is a sort of, you know, great simplification that for the Schrodinger equation of non-interacting electron, uh, we actually know what is the exact solution. So it's actually very simple to solve a Schrodinger equation in which the electrons do not interact. Because now, the Slater determinant uh, is actually the exact uh, solution. So if you have a set of non-interacting electrons, you don't have the electron-electron term in that Schrodinger equation, the Slater determinant uh, is not only a good approximation, uh, but it's actually the exact uh, solution. Okay. So for this uh, non-interacting set of electrons, uh, we can solve uh, everything uh, exactly. And in particular, we can calculate, say, what is the kinetic energy of this set of non-interacting uh, electrons. Okay. So now we can sort of, you know, have a somehow pseudo-physical way of decompose uh, this mysterious uh, density functional into different uh, terms. Okay. So what we are actually doing uh, via the Konechan mapping uh, is extracting from here terms that are very large uh, and that we know how to write, we know how to calculate, uh, and then sort of, you know, hopefully we are going to remain, uh, once we have extracted all these terms that we know how to define, we remain with something that is very small, okay? And that we'll find uh, another approximation, numerical approximation for it. So Konechan say, well, we have this well-defined density functional, we extract uh, two terms that are well defined and these two terms that sort of you know the great achievement uh, actually contain most of the physics of our problem uh, and the sort of small term that is left over uh, we are going to approximate in some simple way and actually the approximation that they found worked uh, very well and that's why sort of density functional theory became a practical theory and so in this sort of density functional the first uh, physical large term that they extract uh, is the quantum kinetic energy that we call TS, uh, not of the real system, because again, even if it's well defined, we don't know how to do that. Uh, but what they were able to write uh, is the quantum kinetic energy of this uh, non-interacting problem. So for a given charge density, there is this set of Kone-Sham non-interacting electrons uh, that lives in a potential such that uh, they have the same ground state charge density and their kinetic energy is trivial because it's going to be just the kinetic energy of the Slater determinant, just a sum of single particle term. So for a charge density now, there is a, a well-defined uh, quantum kinetic energy that is not the true quantum kinetic energy of the system, but is the quantum kinetic energy of this sort of associated system of non-interacting electrons. But this term is now well defined. They say, well, let's extract another term that is well defined that is just the Hartree electrostatic energy of a charge density distribution. Okay. So if we look at a charge density distribution in which each infinitesimal volume interacts with each other infinitesimal volume, with an electrostatic interaction, that's going to be the term. And you know, what we are left uh, is now something that they call the, the exchange correlation term, uh, that is everything else. Okay. So F, uh, in principle, is an exact quantity. We are now able to define a quantum kinetic energy term that is an exact quantity 
but it's not really the quantum kinetic energy of the true system, but we sort of say, you know, this is going to be equal to a well-defined term plus another well-defined term plus a third term that we don't know. So we have sort of decomposed a quantity that we have no clue on what it is uh, into three terms, uh, of which two terms are well-defined, uh, and all our cluelessness uh, is contained in the third term. And we call this third term the exchange correlation. Uh, but the sort of physical advantage uh, of having done this uh, is that it turns out that these two terms uh, capture a lot of the complexity of your problem. Uh, and this term tends to be fairly small. Okay. So that's, uh, that's, that's all, actually. That's why it works very well, because somehow they manage to capture the complexity of our system. And so once uh, that exchange correlation term uh, is defined and it's approximated uh, in some way that we'll see in a moment, uh, um, our uh, problem is now well defined uh, because we really have a variational principle. Remember, the universal density functional plus the external potential uh, plus the charge density in the field of the external potential minimizes uh, the sort of new variational principle that comes from the Hohenberg and Kohn theorem. And so we can write it a variational principle that is this quantity with the constraint uh, that the number of electrons should be equal to n uh, should be minimum. And as usual, when you sort of, you know, you write a variational principle, you are saying that sort of, you know, the differential of that quantity needs to be equal to zero. Or if you want, uh, I mean, this is a generic term, uh, you have a set of what are called Euler-Lagrange equation, basically. But it's nothing else than differential analysis. That is, you're asking yourself uh, what are going to be the conditions that need to be satisfied by the charge density in order to satisfy the variational principle. There is always this sort of one-to-one -one correspondence. You have a variational principle. It gives you differential equation. Or you have differential equation. You can rewrite them in a variational principle. We have seen that for the Schrodinger equation. And we see this in particular now in explicitly for the cone sham orbital. So I'll, I'll actually go directly to the explicit uh, expression of the cone sham uh, um, orbitals. Again, remember that what we have done is uh, we have defined a variational principle uh, that acts on a universal density functional f uh, plus the charge density in the external potential. And we have decomposed, we have extracted from this universal functional sort of terms that are large and physical. And we have sort of pushed uh, all the many body complexity of the problem in something that we call the exchange correlation functional. That is, again, a functional of the charge density. We don't know yet uh, what that function of the charge density is. Uh, but luckily, it's going to be small. So in a moment, we'll approximate it. Uh. And then we ask ourselves, uh, what are uh, the variational, what are the differential equations that derive uh, from this variational principle? Well, in principle, I had written them here. Okay, We just need to take the variation with respect to the charge density and imposing the Lagrange multiplication constraint. And so this, uh, this would be it, basically. That is, the charge density needs to satisfy this set of equations, the sort of functional derivative of this non-interacting quantum kinetic energy, plus uh, a number of terms that really contain the external potential, the Hartree interaction, and the exchange correlation need to be equal to the Lagrange multiplier that fixes the number, the number of electrons. Uh, um, we are not able to calculate uh, this functional derivative uh, because remember that the quantum kinetic energy of the non-interacting system is again written as a later determinant. Uh, and so there is sort of you know this step back. Uh, in which even if we had written everything in terms uh, of a charge density, we are not able to explicitly calculate uh, even uh, not only the derivative of the true interacting electrons kinetic energy with respect to rho, but we are not even able to calculate the functional derivative of the non-interacting kinetic energy with respect to rho. Uh, 
But what we are able is actually to calculate uh, the derivative of that non-interacting kinetic energy with respect uh, to the orbitals uh, that describe the cone sham electrons. Remember that you know, these non-independent cone sham electrons have an exact solution that is a Slater determinant. Uh, and so we know their trivial many body wave function is a Slater determinant uh, composed by single particle orbitals. Uh, and the functional derivative uh, of that uh, indi independent non-interacting electrons kinetic energy with respect uh, to the single particle orbital is now trivial and is just uh, minus one half uh, del square. So at the end of all this sort of complex uh, uh, formulation, what we are left with uh, is something very simple and probably is something you should focus your attention from now on. We have now a set of uh, cone sham equation uh, that are the differential equation that the electrons need to satisfy in order to satisfy the variational principle with the caveat uh, that in this cone sham equation there is a term, uh, an exchange correlation term uh, that we still don't know what it is. Uh, it's sort of formally defined as the functional derivative of the exchange correlation energy with respect to the charge density, but we'll need to approximate somewhere. And what this equation describes uh, is not anymore the true electrons in your system, but they describe uh, these cousins of the true electrons. They describe these cone sham non-interacting uh, electrons uh, that have their own orbital psi i, and that will give us uh, a ground state uh, charge density that if the exchange correlation functional was exact, uh, would be not only the, so, so obviously the same ground state energy of um, our interacting electron system, but it would be sort of the exact solution of the problem. OK, so this equation uh, look a lot uh, like uh, a Schrodinger equation. Uh. They look a lot, if you want, uh, like the Hartree-Fock equation that we had written before, because what we are saying uh, is that uh, a cone sham electron, uh, I, fills uh, a quantum kinetic energy operator, fills a Hartree operator, fills the external potential, and then fills uh, this sort of you know, remaining term that is the exchange correlation potential. Uh, again, if we knew what were this exact exchange correlation potential, we would have an exact solution to the problem. But we know very good approximation. And then, if you want, finding the ground state uh, is not very different from finding the ground state of the Hartree-Fock equation. With the caveat uh, that actually this term here is going to be much simpler than the exchange term of the Hartree-Fock equation. If you go back to the first slide to the Hartree-Fock equation, the last term has a numerically very complex uh, expression in which we sort of uh, take the orbital and we put it inside an uh, integral differential operator. Now it's become uh, simpler. And that's all if you want. So the Konecham equation look very similar. In practice, they are simpler to solve. Uh, they tend to be more accurate uh, in most cases. And that's, at the end, what leads to the success. But what is critical for all of this uh, is having a reasonable approximation to the exchange correlation potential. If we had the exact exchange correlation potential, everything uh, would be exact uh, in this formulation. We would find uh, cone sham independent electrons uh, that were uh, sort of you know, the ground state uh, electrons uh, for that uh, charge density that is ultimately equal to the charge density of the interacting electrons in this external potential. OK. And uh, we have the uh, Euler-Lagrange or Cone-Sham differential equation in the previous page. I written here, sort of, you know, just for reference, uh, also what would be the total energy of the system. And usually, if you had an uh, independent uh, electron, uh, the total energy of the system is trivially the sum of each of the single particle energies. Okay, 
if you have 10 electrons uh, and they don't interact with each other, you can calculate what is the energy of each of these 10 electrons, sum all of them, and that's the total energy of the system. Uh, in this case, it, it's, it's more complex, uh, and the total energy of the system can't be really written as that, but it's got other terms that depend on the charge density. But sort of this is, you know, in summary, what your total energy is. Uh, and again, it's nothing else than kinetic energy term, sort of a Hartree term, function of the charge density, this exchange correlation function, and the interaction, interaction between the external potential and the charge density. But this is actually different uh, from the sum of the eigenvalues. Uh, that would be the sum uh, of the expectation values uh, of uh, psi i calculated uh, on the single particle orbital, where t is again just the simple quantum kinetic energy, and vks uh, is this Konechan potential. So if you want to calculate uh, the total energy of your system, even if it's made of independent electron, you can't sum just the single particle orbitals, uh, but you have to sort of deal with this expression. Nothing complex in this, it's just sort of a caveat uh, that is relevant when you want to sort of, you know, this is the reason why we can't really s find out the equivalent of the Kubman theorems for hartree fock This is why, at the end, uh, these uh, single particle energies uh, are ultimately not uh, physically meaningful. Uh, they sort of, you know, don't give us the total energy of the system just by taking the sum over uh, all of them. Okay, so in order to make this into a practical algorithm, uh, the only part uh, that remains uh, is finding uh, an approximation to that exchange correlation term, to that last term. Remember, we had sort of defined this density functional we have been able to extract uh, two meaningful terms, the Hartree uh, electrostatic energy and the non-interacting Konechan kinetic energy. And we have said that what is left uh, is a function of the charge density that we call the exchange correlation function. How we are going to approximate that? Uh, well, we go back to the Thomas Fermi idea. We are going to do a local density approximation to that uh, exchange correlation functional. So again, what we want to calculate uh, is the exchange correlation energy for any arbitrary charge density. Sometimes I call the charge density N, sometimes I call the charge density rho, but they are always the same. So how do we do this? Uh, well, we don't have the full solution, uh, but what we can say again is that for a in homogeneous charge density that is sort of, you know, changes values and then drops to zero, I can calculate uh, the exchange correlation energy for this charge density distribution by sort of, you know, decomposing it uh, in infinitesimal volumes. Uh, inside each infinitesimal volume, uh, I can say the charge density is constant. Uh, and you see, I make a local density approximation that is, I say the contribution to the overall exchange correlation energy of this non-inhomogeneous system can be broken down, uh, and each infinitesimal volume will give its own contribution to the total exchange correlation density. This is, you know, in principle, it's not correct. I mean, our problem doesn't have to be local in any way. Actually, as people say, this exchange correlation functional, the true one, Although we don't know what it is, uh, we know that it is ultra non-local. So it can't be decomposed uh, into terms that independently sum up. So in principle, we can't do this. Uh, but in practice, it tends to be a good approximation for a lot of cases. Uh. And so what is going to be the contribution to the exchange correlation energy from this infinitesimal volume where, say, the charge density in there is a 0.5, uh, well, what we need to do is uh, we need to find out uh, what is the exchange correlation energy for the homogeneous electron gas that is at this density. That's something that with some advanced uh, 
computational techniques, uh, we can actually find out uh, almost exactly. So we would know if we had a homogeneous charge density 0.5 everywhere, what would be the charge density per unit volume. And we can find out what is you know, the exchange correlation charge density per unit volume, not only for 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, anything. Uh, and what we are saying is that in this non-homogeneous problem, we construct the overall exchange correlation energy by summing up uh, these different pieces. Uh, and so this is what Seperly and Alder did uh, in 1980. They basically found out uh, what was the almost exact sort of closely to numerical exact solution for the homogeneous electron gas. That is, uh, for a system in which you have only electrons uh, homogeneously, so the charge density is identical everywhere, and those electrons interact. So you can calculate the energy of this interacting electron problem exactly as a function of the density. Okay, so you change the density in your sort of volume, and you find out what is this energy. And then you can calculate uh, what is, uh, for you know, any of this density, what is the um, Konecham quantum kinetic energy. You can find out uh, what is the Hartree electrostatic energy. And so you can also find out, uh, for the specific case of the homogeneous gas, uh, you can find out numerically what would be the exchange correlation density. And so that's basically a function. Uh, so for the homogeneous gas, that is for the case in which n doesn't depend on r, people found out uh, what was basically this uh, exchange correlation energy. It was calculated uh, uh, as a function. This is it's a function uh, uh, of what people call rs. rs is the radius of a sphere that contains one electron. So it's a sort of you know, inverse quantity with respect to the density. So numerical calculation, what are called quantum Monte Carlo calculation, really solved uh, the interacting uh, Schrodinger equation problem. But for the specific case of uh, an electron gas uh, that has a homogeneous density, they were able to do that uh, for various density. And so now we have a function for the homogeneous problem. For the non-homogeneous problem, uh, we take a local density approximation, and we say that the overall exchange correlation energy is given by the integral over all the infinitesimal volume. And each infinitesimal volume will have a certain density and will contribute uh, with, you know, with its own density. If the density is going to be equal to here, this will be the value of the contribution of that infinitesimal volume. If the density somewhere else uh, corresponds to this, uh, this will be the correspondence. So we really patch up uh, this overall uh, exchange correlation term uh, from all the little infinitesimal volume, exactly as Thomas Fermi had done. But now we do it uh, for uh, a term uh, that is a much smaller term uh, in our uh, problem. Thomas and Fermi had done it uh, for the quantum kinetic energy. Instead, what Konecham do it, uh, they do it uh, for what is left uh, from their universal functional once you have taken out uh, the electrostatic and once you have taken out the quantum kinetic energy of the non-interacting electrons. At this point, uh, if you want 1980, and even before without the computation with some sort of analytical approximations to this curve, density functional theory becomes not only a theory, but also a practical algorithm. We have a sort of expression for the exchange correlation term. And so now it's just a matter of trying to find out uh, what the solution to these problems are. And because somehow conceptually, we start uh, from the homogeneous electron gas, uh, it turns out that you know, this approach uh, worked uh, especially well for solids. I mean, the valence electrons in a solid uh, are uh, much less uh, structured uh, than the electrons in a molecule that you know, they need to drop to zero. So the charge density in a solid overall varies uh, less dramatically as a function of space uh, than the electron density in atoms and molecules. Uh, and these are actually sort of you know, what were summarized, uh, the numerical result uh, 
of Seperly and Alder. So they had calculated uh, this exchange correlation energy as a function of the density. And that was actually a computational curve of a set of dots. Uh, and uh, this is often cited, again, Perdue and Zunger in a sort of paper of theirs, among other things, uh, sort of you know, suggested uh, uh, analytical interpolation of all the numerical data. And so you see, it's something somehow exotic, uh, but once uh, it's defined, uh, this is just, it's not even a functional, it's just a function of the charge density. So it's something that is very simple to calculate uh, in practice. And so at this point, uh, density functional theory is uh, a well-defined theory. So you see, 1980, Seperly and Alder do this quantum Monte Carlo calculation, find out sort of what is this exchange correlation energy. Perdue and Zunke write out a simple interpolation. 1982, sort of the first time that I think we see sort of where all of this is going. Uh, Marvin Cohen in Berkeley sort of, you know, has been working uh, for two or three years. Uh, Alex Zunger was there, Jason uh, him, number of his students. Uh, they have been able to actually write out all the electronic structure codes uh, that are able to solve the density functional equation for the case of a periodic solid. Uh, and so they address the case of silicon, sort of the most important material in electronics. Uh, and so what they do is they are able now to calculate, you know, the energy of that system uh, as a function of the atomic position, and in particular, as a function of the lattice parameter. So, you know, first thing that they do is they take silicon uh, in its uh, diamond uh, structure, so, you know, the FCC lattice with two atoms as a basis, uh, and they calculate that energy as a function of the lattice parameter. And it looks something like this. Uh, and then, obviously, you know, as you have learned by now, you look at what is the minimum of that energy, and that is the theoretical prediction of the lattice parameter. And this Macon, you know, 1% error. They look at the second derivative. This curvature here is really the bulk modulus of your problem. Again, you know, 5 10% error. And then they say, well, let's suppose that we have silicon not in the diamond phase, but let's suppose that we have silicon in the beta teen phase. And so, you know, this is also experimentally known, and we know in the beta teen what is the lattice parameter of silicon. And we know from the Maxwell construction what is the pressure at which uh, we would have a transition uh, from, uh, say, diamond uh, to beta teen. Uh, and again, you know, I can't remember what was the error, but it's substantially correct. Uh, and, you know, they were able to actually sort of calculate uh, the sort of complex zoology of all the high pressure phases of silicon, and it was in remarkable agreement with experiment. So 1982, this is the in and Cohen, but in particular Marvin Cohen in Berkeley shows that, you know, for a Marvin Cohen, for a realistic uh, case, uh, density functional theory is able really to give us quantitative prediction. Marvin Cohen has actually become this year the president uh, of the American Physical Society. Okay, so this is really the beginning uh, of density functional theory as a practical approach. Uh, and uh, in many ways, uh, what has happened between uh, 1982 and today is that we have become better and better at solving uh, the algorithms uh, for this overall still complex computational problem. And you'll see a lot of this in the next two lectures that follows. And we have become somewhat better, not really dramatically better, in calculating that exchange correlation energy. In a way, sort of, you know, the ideas of uh, uh, Kone Sham from 1965 of having a local density approximation uh, is still very good. I mean, it's not used nowadays uh, anymore that much, uh, but, you know, it's as close as, you know, what we can do now is not really that much better. And, you know, as you can imagine, sort of, you know, what people have done that was a bit better was introducing gradients in your problem. So you have, you're trying to guess uh, what the energy of an inhomogeneous system comes, uh, uh, starting from what you know about the homogeneous electron gas. Uh, well, maybe you should somehow throw in uh, into your problem also the first derivative, the gradient of the density. 
And so people did that fairly soon uh, in the early 80s. Uh, and uh, sort of using the gradients uh, was actually much worse. Uh, there, is, there was you know, a miracle in the local density approximation in which the actual expression of the local density approximation satisfy, satisfies a lot of symmetry properties and scaling properties of what would be the exact exchange correlation functional. The time people put in uh, gradients, uh, all these sort of you know, symmetries and scaling properties uh, were sort of thrown to the dogs, uh, and actually the GGAs, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, the gradient approximation uh, were working much, uh, much worse. Uh, and so people needed to realize uh, sort of in the late uh, um, 80s uh, the work of Axel Becke, of John Perdue especially, a lot uh, that uh, uh, you sort of need to introduce gradients uh, in ways that still satisfy a lot of the, these analytical forms. Uh, and in many ways by now there is a sort of generalized uh, exchange correlation functional that's been sort of developed in the mid-90s by uh, Perdue, Kieran Burke, now at Rutgers, and Matthew, Matthias Erdnerhorf, that is called the PBE functional, that is becoming you know, sort of the workhorse. So a lot of the time you'll see sort of density functional calculation done in the PBE GGA approximation. But again, you know, these are important improvements, uh, but if you want uh, just you know, sort of very little on top uh, of the local density approximation of the 60s. Uh, the chemistry community has also sort of, you know, done a number of very intriguing uh, developments. Uh, um, in particular, there are things that uh, Archie Falk does very well. In particular, because you have the sort of exchange term in Archie Falk, you cancel, remember, the self-interaction, say, in the single electron problem coming from the Hartree, the electrostatic problem. Uh, density functional theory, in theory, in its exact formulation, would be self-interaction corrected, uh, but in practice it is not. If you solve the hydrogen atom with density functional theory, you have that the electron interacts with the charge density created by the same, by the electron itself. And so what sort of the quantum chemistry community has done uh, is uh, well, they said, let's take, you know, LDAs, let's actually take GGAs that seem to work very well, but let's actually construct uh, an exchange correlation functional that has uh, a little bit of this, uh, but it's got also a little bit of what we know worked well in the hartree fock equation. So they construct hybrid functional in which there are sort of pure density functional terms uh, and uh, sort of hartree fock exchange term mixed in. It makes the equation much more complex, uh, and if you want, uh, is a sort of less pure formulation of density functional theory, uh, but it can work uh, reasonably well or very well, especially again for atoms and molecules. Uh, and this is, um, this is where we are, basically, with exchange correlation functional. Um, I think I'll stop here for today, because it's actually a lot of work. Uh, what we'll start seeing in the next class uh, is a sort of, you know, how we actually solve this equation in practice. Uh, on uh, March 8, you'll go into your second lab uh, in which you'll actually study the energy of a solid using density functional theory. Uh, what I said today is probably the last of the conceptual lectures, and I understand that some of it is very complex. Uh, uh, there, are, uh, uh, there is reading material posted on the Stellar website. There is the Koanov Gidopoulos paper on density functional theory, and some of the readings. Uh, uh, that I've given are very useful. The, the two best books uh, that are also cited at the end of this lecture are probably the one uh, by Koch uh, or the one by Parr and Young, both called uh, Density Functional Theory or Density Functional Theory in Practice, and they are cited on the last page. Uh, otherwise, uh, this is it for today, and see you next week.